Hi everyone, my name is Christopher Ferreira Torres. I'm a PhD student at the University of Luxembourg, and today I will be presenting our work called The Eye of Horus, Spotting and Analyzing Attacks on Ethereum Smart Contracts. This is joint work from my colleagues Antonio Yanilo, Artur Gervais, and Radu Stata. As some of you probably already know, in the past few years, smart contracts have been victims to a number of attacks. The most prominent attacks are probably the DAO hack that occurred in 2016 and the two parity wall attacks that happened in 2017. However, almost every year there is at least one reporting in the news about a smart contract that has been attacked. Almost a year ago, in 2020, an attacker was able to exploit a redundancy bug in the decentralized exchange smart contracts of Uniswap and Left.me. The attackers managed to steal tokens worth more than $25 million. Despite this large number of attacks, Ethereum gained tremendously in popularity. For example, Ethereum managed to grow from an average of 10,000 daily transactions in January 2016 to a daily average of 500,000 transactions in January 2020. However, smart contracts aren't like traditional programs. Smart contracts cannot be modified once they have been deployed, unless they have been explicitly designed to do so by the developers. In the response to the growing popularity and the number of attacks, both academia and industry propose a variety of tools to identify vulnerabilities in smart contracts. However, most of these tools only focus on analyzing the bytecode and can therefore only detect bugs, but not attacks. Only a small number of tools have been proposed to analyze transactions in order to detect attacks. However, the proposed tools require modification to the Ethereum client and do not provide the means to perform a post-mortem analysis, such as the tracing of stolen assets. Now, before I explain our proposed solution, I will quickly give a short introduction on Ethereum. Ethereum is a public blockchain similar to Bitcoin, which consists of a peer-to-peer -peer network of mutually distrusting nodes. There are two different types of accounts in Ethereum. User accounts, also known as externally owned accounts, and smart contracts, also known as contract accounts. Both types of accounts hold an address and a balance. The difference is that smart contracts may also run code and persist data across transactions. Transactions may only be initiated by user accounts, and they can include funds as well as data. User accounts may send transactions to other user accounts and smart contracts. Smart contracts may send, as a result of receiving a transaction, so-called internal transactions to other accounts and also send them funds as well as data. Now, if a developer wants to deploy a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, he or she typically first writes a smart contract using a high-level programming language, such as Solidity. The developer then uses the Solidity compiler to translate the source code into bytecode. Finally, the developer takes the bytecode of the smart contract and deploys it to the Ethereum blockchain using a transaction. The bytecode will then be interpreted by the so-called Ethereum Virtual Machine. The Ethereum Virtual Machine is a registerless tech-based virtual machine that defines over 100 different instructions. The instructions range from simple stack instructions such as push and pop to more complex smart contract related instructions such as call and self-destruct. We will be now presenting Horus, a framework for detecting, analyzing, and tracing of smart contract attacks. You can see the overall architecture of Horus. We design Horus as an extract, analyze, and trace pipeline. The first stage is the extraction. The extraction takes as input a list of transactions and generates data log facts that represent the semantics of the executed smart contract logic. The second stage is the analysis. The analysis takes as input the data log facts as well as list of data log queries and produces results about facts for which the queries match. Finally, the third stage is the tracing. The tracing takes as input the data log results as well as a list of account labels and reproduces a transaction graph. The graph can then be further queried to correlate the tags or to track where stolen funds have been transferred to. Now let's go in more detail through each of the three stages. The extraction is composed of an unmodified Ethereum client and an extractor. The extractor has two tasks. The first one is to request for each transaction and execution trace from the Ethereum client via RPC. The second task is to convert the execution trace into data log facts that reflect execution semantics. However, there is one little problem. The RPC interface is rather slow. One solution the previous works chose to opt for is to modify the client to bypass the RPC and directly log information that is relevant to them. However, users are then required to use a modified version of the client and the changes must be carried over on every release of a new client which makes it hard to maintain. Woody decided to go for a different option. Instead, we inject our own JavaScript based tracer into the client. This tracer tries to improve the speed of RPC by limiting the amount of returned information. 
For example, we remove non-relevant information such as the program counter or gas cost. Also, we only keep stack elements and memory slices that are relevant to the particular instruction. This approach does not require us to modify the client. The extractor produces data log flags by iterating through the execution trace and by encoding relevant information. The figure on the right hand side shows a list of data log flags that are produced by Horus. Most flags are related to low level EVM instructions such as opcode and call. However, others are related to more high level protocol operations such as for example DRC20 token transfers. We use the default type number to encode integer values smaller than 64 bit and a default type symbol to encode long sequences of bytes. We also define our own types, namely address to encode values of account addresses that are 160 bit, opcode to encode EVM opcode names, and value to encode 256 bit stack values. We also provide a data log flag called data flow. Security experts can use this fact to check if data flows during execution from one EVM instruction to another. Taint is introduced as so-called sources, then propagated across executed instructions, and finally checked at so-called sinks. Sources are typically instructions that introduce untrusted data, such as call data load or call data copy. Sinks are typically instructions that represent sensitive program locations, such as call or as store. We implemented our own Taint analysis engine that introduces Taint at the byte level by tagging the affected stack value, memory region, or storage location, according to the definition of the semantics of the Ethereum virtual machine. As an example, the add instruction takes the first two elements on the stack, adds them together, and plays the result back on the stack. Hence, if at least one of the two elements is tainted, then the result will be also tainted. Another example is the SHA-3 instruction. The instruction takes a sequence of bytes from memory, computes the SHA-3 hash, and places it onto the stack. The result will be tainted if at least one byte of the bytes taken from memory is tainted. Another important aspect is the execution order of transactions. Attacks may be composed of two or more transactions being executed in a specific order. A prime example are the two parity wall attacks, where the attacker had to first set itself as the owner before being able to exploit the contract. We encode a total order across multiple transactions via triplet, where B is the block number, T is the transaction index, and S is the execution step. The later is a simple counter that is reset at the beginning of the execution and incremented after each executed instruction. The value B defines the order across blocks, whereas T defines the order within a block and S defines the order within a transaction. Combined, B, T and S define the order of executed instructions across the entire blockchain history. We now move on to the analysis. We use the optimized data log engine called Souffle to analyze if a given list of data log queries match any of the previously extracted data log facts. The goal of these data log queries is to identify adversarial transactions. These are malicious transactions that successfully carried out a concrete attack against a smart contract by exploiting a given vulnerability. In our paper, we present queries to detect reentrancy, the two parity wall attacks, integer overflows, unhandled exceptions, and short address attacks. Now let's try to go through a few examples. Here you can see an example of a data log query to detect a second parity wall attack. We first check if there are two transactions, one that calls the init wallet function and another one that calls the kill function. Afterwards, we check if both transactions were successful. And finally, we verify the order of these transactions by checking if the block number of the second transaction is larger than the block number of the first transaction or in case both transactions are part of the same block, if the transaction index of the second transaction is larger than the transaction index of the first transaction. In this example, you can see a data log query to detect integer overflows. First, we try to detect if an overflow occurred by checking if the aromatic result is not the same as the result computed by DVM. Afterwards, we define the opcodes call data load and call data copy as our sources, and a write to storage as our sync. Then we check if data flows from either call data load or call data copy into an aromatic operation that resulted in an overflow, and if the result of the operation flows into storage. Finally, we check if there is an ERC20 token transfer with the amount that caused the overflow. As in the last example, we present a data log query to detect an unhandled exception. First, we check if there is a call that fails. Afterwards, we check if the result of the failed call is not used in a condition. 
The later is a data lock relation that tries to detect if data flows from a given execution step into a branching condition that influences the control flow of a smart contract. Finally, the last stage in our pipeline is the tracing. The tracer extracts the transaction sender addresses and timestamps from the data log results. Here we assume that the sender addresses of the transactions that have been identified as adversarial transactions belong to attackers. Afterwards, we retrieve for each sender address all its normal transactions, internal transactions, and token transfers and load them into a Neo4j graph database. Accounts are encoded as vertices and transactions as directed edges between those vertices. We can either load transactions backwards or forwards. Backwards means that we load transactions that occurred before the time step of the identified adversarial transaction. Forwards, on the other hand, means that we load only transactions occurred after the identified adversarial transaction. Loading transactions backwards allows us to identify if multiple attacker accounts belong together or where the attackers get their funds to bootstrap attacks. Loading transactions forwards allows us to track where stolen funds are transferred to and what services or exchanges attackers are using. Transactions are loaded recursively for neighboring accounts and for up to a given number of hops. Our tracer does not load transactions for accounts with more than 1,000 transactions to avoid loading the graph. Accounts with more than 1,000 transactions are typically mixing services or exchanges. Finally, security experts can query the graph database to do post-mortem analysis. We'll be now presenting the evaluation of our tool. We use the Ethereum ETL framework to retrieve a list of transactions and deploy smart contracts. We collected within the first 10 million blocks over 600,000 transactions and more than 3 million smart contracts. The deployment time steps of the smart contracts range from August 7, 2015 to May 4, 2020. We filtered out contracts without transactions, transactions that do not execute code, and transactions that were part of the 2016 denial of service attacks. We ended up with a dataset of over 1 million smart contracts and over 300,000 transactions. We run Horus on those 300,000 transactions and generated roughly 700 gigabyte of data log facts. The following table summarizes our results. We found 1,888 vulnerable contracts in 8,095 adversarial transactions. Majority of these contracts and transactions are related to unhandled exceptions. We also validated our results by comparing our findings to those of previous works or by manually verifying the source code whenever it was available. As you can see, Horus only has one false positive and achieves on average a very high precision of 99.54%. Now we'll talk about the analysis that we did on the results that we gathered. The first research question that we tried to answer with our analysis is whether the number of attacks decreased over time as a result of the large number of tools that are publicly available to detect bugs in smart contracts. In this figure, you can see the number of deployed smart contracts versus the number of attacks over time. We see that smart contracts are still being deployed on the Ethereum blockchain with an average of more than 2,000 contracts per day. We also see three large spikes in the number of daily attacks. The first spikes are related to the DAO hack in 2016, the second spike is related to the Parity Wall attacks in 2017, and the last spike is related to the Uniswap and Lap.me hacks in 2020. Overall, we see that the number of daily attacks is not that high. In this figure, we try to measure the volume of stolen funds in terms of US dollar per attack. We do not have numbers in terms of volume for short address and integer overflows, since these attacks involve tokens and we were not able to obtain the price of these tokens for the moment of the attack. Overall, we see that the DAO hack and the first parity wall attack resulted in a lot of funds being stolen and that unhandled exceptions resulted in a large number of funds not being transferred to the rightful owners. We also see that the number of short address attacks and integer overflows seem to have decreased over time, whereas the number of reagency attacks and unhandled exceptions seem to have remained almost constant. So coming back to our initial research question, where the number of attacks have decreased over time, we conclude that integer overflows and short address attacks seem to have decreased. However, redundancy attacks and unhandled exceptions seem to still occur frequently and involve a significant amount of funds. 
Now we move on to a second research question that we tried to answer, namely, how useful is horrors in analyzing attacks post-mortem? Security experts are often required to present a post-mortem analysis of an incident and highlight, for instance, how many funds have been stolen or where the funds have been transferred to. We therefore decided to use the detection and tracing capabilities of horrors to perform a post-mortem analysis on two re-entrancy attacks that happened in April 2020. On April 18th, an attacker was able to drain a large amount of ether from Uniswap. The attacker exploited a feature in a token which would allow the attacker to register a callback function and therefore perform a reentrancy attack on Uniswap. The attacker would start by purchasing tokens for Ether. Afterwards, the attacker would exchange half of the purchased tokens within the same transaction back to Ether. However, the later would trigger a callback function that the attacker registers before the attack, allowing the attacker to take control and call back the Uniswap contract to exchange the remaining half of the tokens back to Ether before the conversion rate was updated. Thus, the attacker could trade the second batch of tokens at a more profitable rate. Horus identified 525 transactions performing a reactancy attack against Uniswap on that day, with an accumulated profit of more than 1,278 ether. The following figure depicts the timeline of the attack, showing the amount of ether that the attacker invested and the net profit the attacker made per transaction. The attack started around 1 o'clock UTC time, and lasted for three and a half hours. Next, we trace the entire ether flow from the attacker's account for up to five hops using Horus tracing capabilities. A transaction graph analysis reveals that the attackers exchange roughly 55% of the stolen funds for tokens on different exchanges such as Uniswap, Compound, and OneInch. Now, one day later, on the 19th of April 2020, an attacker performed a similar attack on the Lamp.me exchange. Similar to the Uniswap attack on the day before, the attack started roughly at 1 o'clock UTC time and lasted for 2.5 hours. The attacker exploited the same token that would allow the attacker to register a callback function to perform a reactancy attack. The attacker would start by depositing X amount of tokens into Lamp.me's liquidity pool. Next, still within the same transaction, the attacker would deposit another amount Y, however, this time triggering the callback function that the attacker previously registered. This callback function would then withdraw the previously deposited X tokens from Lamp.me, and by the end of the transaction, the token balance of the attacker would be X minus Y on the token contract, but the token balance on the Lamp.me contract would be X plus Y, thereby increasing its balance on Lamp.me by X without actually having deposited this amount of tokens. Similar to Uniswap, the issue here is that the user's balance is only updated after the transfer of tokens. Just the update is based on data before the transfer and therefore ignoring any updates made in between. Using Horus, we identified a total of 46 transactions performing rentancy attacks against Lamp.me and 19 transactions using the stolen tokens to borrow other tokens. The attacker borrowed from 12 different tokens worth together more than 25 million US dollars. Finally, we used Horus to trace the flow of stolen tokens from the attacker's account for up to three hops. We found that the attacker initially traded some of the stolen tokens for other tokens on Paraswap, Compound, Aave, and OneInch. However, around 10 hours later, the attacker started sending back all the tokens to Lamp.me's admin account. Lamp.me then moved all the tokens into a recovery account where users could then reclaim their stolen tokens. So now regarding our question whether Horus is useful in analyzing post-mortem attacks, we can say that one, Horus was able to detect the Uniswap and Lamp.me attacks. Two, Horus was able to precisely measure the amount of funds that have been stolen. And three, Horus was able to identify where the attackers transferred their stolen funds to. Now I will shortly conclude our work. In this work we presented Horus, an extensible framework for carrying out automated studies that detect, analyze and trace smart contract attacks. We also analyzed more than 300,000 transactions ranging from August 2015 to May 2020. We identified 8,095 attacks and 1,888 vulnerable smart contracts. Our analysis also revealed that integer overflows and short address attacks seem to have decreased, while unhandled exceptions and reactancy attacks still remain an issue. Finally, we demonstrated the practicality of horrors in analyzing the flow of stolen funds on the recent Uniswap and Lamp.me incidents. Thank you for your attention. All the code and data is publicly available on GitHub. 
If you have any questions, feel free to drop me a message at christoph.horus at uni.lu. This work was supported by the Luxembourg National Research Fund.